Friends, hello, hello and welcome to 1030 Worship here at First Pres. It's a joy to see, wow, round of applause today from Kelly Glars A, round of applause. Chris, I need to make a brief announcement. Um, we have all nine hearing packs here for the Here to Assist hearing technology, using that word in lots of different ways. However, we got some feedback at 8.30 that not all the hearing packs are working well. So we really want to encourage you, if you get a hold of a pack that's not working, to sort of set it aside, give it to a deacon, let them know, and go get another one. And all of them are filled with fresh batteries as of Friday. Yep. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. They need to face front. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. That's good to know. It is true. The way that you hold the pack actually can kind of manipulate the sound a little bit. So make sure you find where the pack needs to be as it sits on your chest. Um, Y'all, wanted to make an announcement before we get going. If you were not, if you did not join us last week, you're lucky because they're happening all month long. Together on Tuesdays is every Tuesday in the month of June, 6.30 to 8. Last week we were joined by Nico's Cheesecake and they were amazing. I literally took like three home with me. Um, but this week we're having a little bit of a grill out. Parker Adamson is going to bring his grill. We're going to get some stuff on there. Um, would love to have you join us 6.30 to 8. We'll keep an eye on the temperature in case we need to adjust where we are, but hope to see you. Body, Mind, Soul Camp starts this week. Uh, the downstairs is fully decorated, and our director of Christian formation, Mallory Montoya, is really looking forward to welcoming the children. Thanks to those of you that have uh, helped her in a variety of ways. Uh, we look forward to the time. Yeah. And just maybe a thank you to David Nesbitt, who joined us at our 915 Christian Formation Hour. It was a joy to have him, and it was fascinating. David is an architect in town. Um, and if you're interested in joining that class, join us next week, 915. All right. But friends, we uh, come here with things that uh, lay heavy on our hearts, or maybe that buoy us up. Uh, today, we especially remember uh, Sandra Dubowski. Sandra is having surgery this week on her arm. Um, we also remember Mary Lanham. Uh, Mike Lanham passed away very unexpectedly this past week. Many of you probably know Mike. Uh, he was a through and through Presbyterian. And so please keep Mary and all of their children um, in your prayers. We also want to celebrate, if you didn't notice, we have a rose sitting close to the chancel. Um, and that is because uh, there has been a new birth in the church family. We are super, super excited that little Claire Shrotel is back from the hospital. The family is back from Houston. Uh, and parents Connor and Alex are, are getting acquainted. So keep them in your prayers as well as we, as we pilgrim with them this week. But whatever you carry with you on your heart, we come to the font. Because this is the place that holds us. And we pour the water and we remember our baptism, saying again, Welcome, Welcome home, home children, children of God. Of God.
Just two more notes. I received an update from Dave Dow, a woman he has loved very much, died Friday evening, and Rafa. And so we hold David in our prayers, as we also hold Austin Ingalls, whose father was admitted to the ER and is making a recovery this morning. Please rise up in body or in spirit to join in the call to worship. O oh, Maker, live in us. Cover us in days of celebration. Cover us in days of struggle. O oh, Christ, live in us. When friends are gathered at our table or when trials wait outside our doors. O oh, Spirit, live through us. Let's join together in praise. Alleluia.
Friends, you may be seated. Thank you. Friends, let's come together in one heart and one voice, using the prayers given to us by our brothers and sisters in the Christian Church of Nigeria as we confess our sins together. Lord, who formed the human family to live in harmony and peace, we acknowledge before you our divisions, hatred, injustices, and greed. May your church demonstrate before the world the power of the gospel to destroy division, so that in Jesus there may be no barriers of wealth or class, age or intellect, gender or identity, race or color, but all may be equally your children, members one of another, and heirs together of your everlasting kingdom. Amen. The Psalms tell us that God's forgiveness is as wide as the East is from the West, that it is more abundant than every grain of sand on the seashore. And so take heart. Today you are forgiven and be at peace. But don't just keep that peace to yourself, but rise and share it with your neighbor saying, the peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with all of you. As we continue greeting one another, let's sing our children forward for some time together. Um, um, let's see. Let me see if I can grab a little. Come on, y'all. There's always more room. Take a seat. Take a seat. You're good. Mr. Miles, I love the bow tie. So I want to do some introductions. Our parish associate, Reverend Dr. Jim Eller, has grandchildren here today. And I know you're more than his grandchildren. So would you want to speak into the microphone and introduce yourself? I'm Lucas. You're Lucas. Lucas. Would you like to speak into the microphone? I'm Fiona. Fiona. Would you like to introduce your brother? He's Caden. Caden. Welcome. Oh my gosh. Caden, Lucas, and Fiona. We're glad you're here. You Welcome like to, to the say party. Something in the microphone, Theo. Nice. I love it. I love it. I love it. You guys just let me know. I'm right here with the microphone. <laughs> Okay, hang Sheesh. on, I'm coming. One more time. 
What's wrong? You and I both know something's wrong uh -oh. with that. Give it a try. <laughs> oh, there oh, it was. There it was. <laughs> Perfectly done. Well done. Frank. All right. Well Sorry done. about that, Chris. No. So y'all, every Sunday this month, in the month of June, we're watching movies. Do you guys like movies? Y'all like probably never watch movies, do you? You've never seen a movie your entire life? Never? Oh my gosh, no? So we are, we are watching a different movie every single Sunday, and then we are talking about it up here in the chancel. And Pastor Leslie and myself are going to talk about it a little bit with y'all. And so this movie, the movie we selected today is called My Neighbor Totoro. Have y'all ever heard of this movie? Sarah Ogle's like, yes. Has anybody else ever seen this movie? It's what you would call an anime movie. Do you know what that means? Does, Sarah, do you want to tell us what an anime movie is? Can you explain to us? Can I borrow yeah, those absolutely. Mics? Yeah, what's an anime movie? From my understanding, anime is a Japanese style of animation. Um, so it's a certain type of style. And there tend to be certain types of stories that are told using anime. Brilliantly done. Brilliantly done. So this film is... Do you saw this movie. Chris, so, I have a confession. Yeah. I forgot to watch it. Oh my gosh. It's okay. Of all people. It's all right. I'm so sorry. It's okay. We talked about it. So yeah. So what happens, y'all, is in this movie, an anime film, it's usually Japanese, and this one is done by a guy named Miyazaki. Can you say that word with me? Miyazaki. 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 What a cool name. And in the movie, what happens is a family moves away to a really rural part of Japan. You guys ever been in a really rural part of the world before? What's it like when you're in a rural place? What is that like? A country. You've never left Texas? There are some rural parts of Texas, though. Are there a lot of people in rural parts of the world? Is, is everybody kind of over top of one another? Or what is it like to be in a rural part of the world? This I can answer because yeah. I was from Kansas where there's more space than actual people. And so the, the space that each person has is really a lot. It's a lot of space. Yeah, a lot of space. Yeah. So you can drive for long distances and not see a house. And I think it's similar in some parts yeah. of Texas. And so can you imagine this? Imagine that one day you left your school and all of your friends and you moved to a really far away place where you couldn't really hang out with anybody because there was nobody around you. It sounds kind of like, a, it sounds pretty much like a bummer, right? It doesn't sound fun. And so what happens is this young girl is taken out to the countryside to this really rural place and she's kind of lonely. But all of a sudden, this imaginary creature, he looks kind of like a bear and a, like a, looks like a bear. Yeah. And his name is Totoro. Totoro. And Totoro. Can you say that name with me? Totoro. 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 And what happens is she and Totoro go on all kinds of fun adventures together. Sarah, is, that, is there anything you would add to that? Have I kind of, is that kind of the basic premise? I think so. It's been a while since I've yeah. seen the movie. Yeah. But. And so, y'all, this is one thing that I wanted to share with you, is even myself. Now, I'm a grown-up. I'm much older than that young girl was when she moved out to the countryside. And yet, even in my life, there are certain times when my imagination helps to keep me company. But there are certain ways in which when I imagine things, they kind of help to, to buoy me up in times when I might feel lonely. But I want to talk to you about something, because I think we all have one of these at home. Or maybe some of us do. And I think sometimes we're pretty imaginative with them. I'm going to show you mine, okay? Can I hold that box for you? What is that? It's a dog. And this isn't just any dog. This is my dog, Jed. And Jed is wearing a birthday hat because it was his birthday last year. And you know what? When I'm feeling really lonely, now Jed doesn't talk to me. He can't speak English words that I can understand. And yet sometimes I feel like I know exactly what Jed is feeling, or I know exactly what Jed is wanting me to say. And sometimes our imagination, even though Jed might be real, that sometimes we fill in the blanks with our imaginations and they help us to make relationships and to make really deep friendships, even when we can't understand something, that sometimes our imagination is part of what God uses to make us feel loved 
not just by other people, but even by creatures that aren't human. Kind of like my neighbor Totoro. This girl felt so lonely, and yet it, it was this creature that she had imagined that wasn't even an animal, that wasn't even a human being. And yet it reminded her of how loved she really was. Leslie, is there anything you want to add to that? No, I really like, um, I think I like to imagine, I have a couple of dogs, Coco and Nova, and I also have three cats, and they're all really different, but I feel really um, understood when they come and sit by me. That's right. Yeah. That's right. How many of y'all have pets? In the congregation, how many of y'all have pets? Pets. See? Amen. <laughs> Miles is just chilling. You have a dog too? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh my gosh. It's so right. Y'all, so what we're going to do is we're going to stand up and face them, okay? And we're going to say a prayer together and we're going to teach it to you, okay? So follow me. Charlotte, you know what we're going to do? Yeah. It goes like this. God be in my head. God be in my heart. God be on my left. God be on my right. God be beneath me. God be above me. God be in the faces of all who love me. Go and be imaginative this week, friends. I needed a little camera on Arthur and Miles as their dads were moving them through the prayer. I love it. Hey, thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Join me in a word of prayer as we uh, prepare to hear uh, from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 2, verses 1 to 14. Let us pray. Gracious God, it is such a privilege to draw our breath, to live our life amid challenges and joys. Such a privilege to be alongside each other and affected by each other. As we attend to your word, may the listening, the living of the word, may these things be to your glory in service of the neighbor. We pray these things as we beseech your spirit. Amen. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah said to Elisha as they were on their way to Gilgal, Elijah said, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel, and the company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, hey, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? Elisha said, yeah, I know. Be silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But Elisha said to Elijah, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho and the company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? Elisha answered, yes, I know, be silent. Then Elijah said to Elisha yet again, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan, but, he said, but, Elisha said, oh, I'm sorry, Elisha said, stay here, for the Lord sent me to the Jordan, but Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on, 50 men of the company of prophets also went and stood some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted on one side and to the other until the two of them crossed through on dry ground. When they crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, please, let me inherit a double share of your spirit. Elijah responded, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended into a whirlwind and crying out, 
Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, Elisha cried. But when Elisha could no longer see Elijah, he grabbed his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He picked up the mantle that Elijah had dropped and went back and stood at the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he struck the water, the water parted to one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading today comes to us from Paul's second epistle to the church in Corinth. Hear these words. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. But we were afflicted in every way, disputes without and fear within. But God, who consoles the downcast, consoled us by the arrival of our friend Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with, it, with, with which he was consoled about you. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Okay, so if you weren't with us last week, we're starting a series that we are calling Real Spirituality, Real with Two E's. And in this sermon series, we are talking a little bit, Leslie, about scripture and we're pairing it together with recent blockbusters. And so today, do you want to say anything about this movie? Oh, that we I, watched this week? yeah, I really, I really liked this movie. I'm a little jealous that it's yours, <laughs> Free Sean. Um, Banshees of, I say Inishira. I don't know. I, Inish, I say Inishira. Inishira. So, um, I, I have to confess that I kind of like dark movies, and yeah. this is definitely dark. Um, I appreciate it that when he said he was going to cut off a finger, he did it. He really followed um, it. I, I really liked, um, I really liked the way it followed their friendship, even through imperfect moments. Mm, yeah. um, I don't know. No, I loved it too. Did you, what did you think about, I mean, the cinematography, the way in which I found it beautiful? Yeah, it was gorgeous. I mean, I appreciated the way that it really attended to pathways through the village. I thought it was really clear that these two men were on a journey. Um, I couldn't quite figure out where the city center was, yeah. other than the bar, but, yeah. you know. Other than the bar. Um, but I, I appreciated that, too. I, I didn't really understand all the movie. It just gave me a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone said at 8.30, they said that they thought the best characters in the movie were the animals. Well, that's... The donkey. And I heard a yes from back at the donkey. Yeah, no, that's really insightful. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I agree with the best. Well... I really liked the friend who was trying to cut it off. Cut off the friendship, cut off his finger, <laughs> all of his But um, I, thought, I thought he was very interesting. He's got real commitment to severing that tie and to severing other things. Yeah. And in the end, do you feel like they severed it? Do they feel like they severed Well, I feel like in, at the end of the movie, so don't want to ruin it if you haven't seen it yet. But at the end of the movie, I almost feel like it shows you that there's another kind of bond that hatred makes. Okay. That in sometimes like anger, that usually the people we're most angry at are the people that we love the most. Anger. And so even though they hate each other, that has its own kind of intimacy. So anger has a, a level of intimacy. I think so. I mean, that we, how often are we thinking about people and we're like, ugh, or we're still thinking about them all the exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah. You know? So what would you rate the movie out of 10? I, I'm at a 9. Whoa! Really yeah. Last week was 5.5. Well, I didn't want it. No one? Yeah. I would be similar. I would be up there too. I would probably say 8.5 or 8, but I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for letting me chat about it. Always. Thank okay. you. Y'all, the genre of this movie is the Banshees of Inishirin, Inishirin, something. Um, it is what you would call a black comedy, a black comedy. And mainly what that means is it's of a genre that really looks at the comic inside of the tragic. That it's something where, where people look at tragic situations and they're able to find levity and buoyance in them. Um, and they're able to kind of laugh at themselves, even in the most tragic of circumstances. But I will say that I felt honored when last week at the end of the service as I was getting ready to leave the church, a member came up to me and she said to me, she said, I watched that movie that you're preaching on next week and I will not be coming to church that day. So what are you making us watch? I'm glad to say that person is in church today. So I will not <laughs> tell you who they are. But the question that this person said, with, said to me has kind of stuck with me. Indeed, what are, what are we watching when we watch a black comedy like this? Uh, it's often said that for most of us, um, that we require a double portion of joy to get us through the tragic moments in our lives. But they say that for the Irish, along with maybe a pint of Guinness, that it's often a double portion of tragedy that they need to get through the joyous parts of life. That they really do have a dark sense of humor. But I'm wondering, I think the question for this sermon, if I had to put it maybe bluntly and crudely, would be something like this. What do we learn 
by exposing ourselves to these tragic circumstances. What do we come away with from dwelling in the tragedy that this movie relays to us? What are we left with on the other side? Well, the premise of the movie, it's quite, it's quite simple, really. It's one, something that maybe most of us can relate to, but it's about one man's deep desire to just go to the pub and have a pint with his best friend. That's all he wants. But he runs into one very, very large obstacle to that desire, and that's that one day that friend wakes up and realizes that they're really tired of being this person's friend. And so for half of the movie, without really understanding why, we just watched Brendan Gleeson just totally ignore Colin Farrell for no reason. We're not giving any reason for why this is. But I think Banshees of Anishirin is about a certain kind of fraternal fracturing that we experience in our culture. It's about brothers who can so easily become enemies. It's about friendships that can so easily become estrangements. The, the film is beautifully and immaculately set on the backdrop of the coast of Ireland. It takes place in a little fabled town during the Irish Civil War in the 1920s, and it is gorgeous. But of course, what is a civil war if not also just a battle between people who should be friends? I think one of the one of the the hard parts about this movie is that it dispels any illusion of innocence. That it shows how somewhere deep within all of us that resentment and insecurity can fog our minds. It shows us how our fantasies of rebellion, when we just want to show them what's right, that often that can not just hurt our neighbor, but ultimately hurt ourselves. It shows us how cruelty and irrationality can become tempting when we feel hurt or when we fear. Have I sold you on this movie yet? Are you really excited to add this to your summer watching list? Okay, but I want to take a maybe preliminary stab at the original question that I raised for you all. What is it that we learn from exposing ourselves to these tragic situations? And I think maybe I have one idea, at least one idea. I think sometimes these movies, these black comedies, they have a way of helping us learn how to love the things that we will come to lose that they teach us that ultimately the things that we find the most meaning in, that we love the most, that often they are the most fragile parts of our lives. That they are so easy to break. That somewhere at bedrock, life is about coming to love fragile things. And maybe it's the gospel truth that even in their fragility, we're able to see just how beautiful they really are. I think it teaches us that in a world that is saturated by different kinds of relationships, some that are really kind of surface level, that maybe all we need is really just one good, deep friendship. Fragility is often not a word that I think people associate with religion. In our 945 Christian Formation Hour, David Nesbitt showed us these buildings that, that the church has built throughout time. They're buildings that communicate permanence, buildings that, that communicate structure, power. But I don't know if that's exactly what the scripture says about fragility. I think fragility was a word that Elijah and Elisha knew well. I think the prophet's job in some ways was to become was to come to accompany their fragility in a certain kind of way. You see, the, the, the text that Leslie read for us, the Book of Kings, is really a saga of broken promises. The, the Jewish people have come to occupy the land that was promised to them, and ultimately when they get in it, they become comfortable. They forget that old-time religion and the God who got them there. And so they abandon God. They start building these golden calves and worshiping idols. The God who led them out of Egypt is nowhere to be seen. 
And yet God sends a prophet. One meager, small, fragile prophet to keep that kindle of hope lit, even when their cultural surroundings testify to the opposite, that God is still very much present. The, co- that the book of Kings talks how the temple has now become a funding place for the battles of warlords. Maybe we know ourselves how religion can come to fund the ideological battles of politicians. And yet Kings has one word in particular for this, idolatry. The people have forgotten where they are from, where they have come from, the God who has led them out of enslavement. The glory days are behind them. And though the surroundings are bleak, Elijah has been chosen by God to be a vessel for God's truth. He ends up making enemies of almost all the people. And in one of the most, I think, instructive passages from Scripture, Elijah gets fed up. He wails, he tears his clothes, he throws himself down on the ground and offers his hands up and starts yelling at God, God, I have had enough of this. I would rather die than do this anymore. And maybe in some of the most profound words offered by the God of the Old Testament, God looks at Elijah and says, friend, we're going to get you some food and a nap, and things will be better in the morning. But Elijah was familiar with his own fragility. So in our passage for today, we're greeted with a text that talks about a fiery chariot that comes down and sweeps up this prophet. I can guarantee you that if you go to the back and you look at the coloring pages that our children have been given for this week, it'll talk about this story and about the fiery chariot, about the miracle of being taken up by God. But I don't know if that's the real miracle of this story. You see, the author only allocates two verses to that fiery chariot, but almost the entire buildup before is about the friendship established between Elisha and Elijah. That now, instead of food and a nap, God gives Elijah a friend. God gives Elijah someone to accompany him on the journey. And so three times before that fiery chariot comes, we recite the same dialogue. Elijah tells Elisha, hey, I've got to go and do my work for the Lord. I need you to stay here. And almost responding without blinking an eye, Elisha says, as long as the Lord lives, I won't leave you. You're not going alone. But if you were to look up these places on a map, if you were to look up Gilgal and Jordan, Jericho on a map, it would seem like quite an odd itinerary. And if you know anything about the Hebrew Bible, then you know that these are extremely important places in the Jewish imagination. They are places of triumph, of victory. Maybe you remember that old time song we all were taught in Sunday school about how the walls of Jericho just came tumbling down, right? Or maybe you've read about the town of Ai and how the sun stood still as Joshua defeated his enemies. Maybe you've read about the crossing of the Jordan when that fateful moment when the Israelites finally made it to the promised land And the waters literally divided themselves, welcoming in the Israelite people. But now all has been forgotten. The triumphs have long been forgotten. The Jewish people have long forsaken their story and the God who led them through it. At one point in time, these sacred sites spoke of God's victory and God's faithfulness. But now they tell a story about estrangement. But do you see what's happening here? This might all sound very sad to you, but but Elisha is not letting Elijah flee into that darkness by himself. Maybe we all know those parts in our own lives, those parts of ourselves that once held us up, that we counted as victories, the parts in our lives where we felt triumphant. Maybe we've also known what it means to lose that feeling, to feel like we've been forgotten, like the story that once held us together can barely keep us from falling apart. But if anything, the Banshees of Anishinaabe shows the cruelty of isolation. I think Elisha shows us what faithful companionship really looks like. 
that we will not go alone into the darkness, no matter what it looks like. That often we become fascinated by the fiery chariot that awaits Elijah, but I wonder if the real miracle is that we are not alone. And if the gospel is true, then friends, we should expect to be implicated in one another's messiness. We should expect that friendship should become a possibility even become between unlike peoples. We should expect to be community, to not let each other go. You see, now that I'm a pastor, I keep getting all these Facebook notifications, these Facebook advertisements about how I can grow my ministry with five easy steps. You know, it's that easy. It just requires five easy steps. And by thriving ministries, I often think that what, what these Facebook advertisers mean is they mean ministries that will grow as fast as possible, that will attract as many people as possible as quickly as to me. But I wonder if our text this morning forces us to think about growth in a different way. That if we were asked, what does it mean to measure the faithfulness of this place, of the church? I wonder if we wouldn't just count names in pews, however much money we were able to raise for this or that cause. I wonder what it would mean to measure our discipleship by the number of people who, knew, who we knew that we could call upon in the middle of the night. The amount of times that we stayed to linger with that stranger just to talk a few moments longer. The number of donuts and cups of coffee that we consumed after worship, becoming even better acquainted with that person who maybe is a stranger to us. The number of times that we took that first year college student to lunch because they felt like they were on their own for the first time in their lives. The number of times that we were inconvenienced helping that person next to us in worship. What if friendship was the measure by which we adjudicated this place? Because we need each other. We need each other. So I've tried to bat this back and forth in my head, thinking of a slogan that maybe we could adopt for the Christian church. And I wonder if this would be, if this would be a good one. Organized religion for disorganized people. Or maybe even better, how about this one? That the Christian faith is about grace for people who know that they really need it. Now maybe God's grace find us, finds us in moments of triumph and in fiery chariots raining down from the sky, but maybe grace even more often finds us in small gestures of companionship. When our friends know that they can count on us, or when we know that we don't have to walk the road alone. Like the time of Kings, the Banshees of Anishirin, it's a quiet saga about broken promises. It's about how easy it is to fall into hatred and animosity. That makes it a hard watch. But faith can handle our hurt. Faith can handle our hatred and our division. You see, Jesus came into the world not just to forgive us, but to heal us. Jesus came into this world not just to instruct us to walk alongside of us. Jesus came into this world to call us friends. For even in our darkness, he won't leave us alone. Amen. I invite you to rise up in body or in spirit to make your response in our affirmation of faith with the Apostles' Creed. With one voice, wherever we are, let us join together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And then he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the 
resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. May be seated as our ushers come forward to receive this great offering from our mind. Amen. For the torso of strength that holds all of the vital organs that digest, pump, oxygenate, all uniquely and differently able. Our prayers are with those human beings who draw enough energy then to share it with others, to nurture those who are growing, to comfort those who are afflicted, to strengthen those who are in need of courage. God of our shoulders, our arms, the tips of our fingers, a prayer for humanity in its reach, each of us uniquely and differently able to carry weight, to reach to the right and to the left, to embrace, to cradle, to carry, Our prayer rises toward this brain that you have given us. Each of us hold it uniquely and differently able that we may think and reconsider, that we may hold memories and imagination, that we may walk into your world new each and every day. Strengthen the bodies, the body politic, the community upon the planet. These things we pray as we remember Christ's prayer taught so long ago, saying, Our Father, who 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from it. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Any of it and on it, and all of it is perhaps possible because there is a God who goes with us, a spirit that dwells inside of us, and a Christ who calls us friend. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs> 